Join me now in the studio to discuss it. Talk TV Royal Editor Sarah Houston. Good to see you, Sarah. Thank you for coming in. Um, when we, I mean, we were together live on air on Talk TV uh, following Kate's announcement on Friday, and the news was beginning to sink in and percolate. And I suppose one of the things that her great bravery has engendered in so many people is 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 the desire to face up to the possibility that they might have a cancer diagnosis rather than doing what some people naturally do, which is just think, oh my God, I think I better not go to the doctor. I don't want to check this out. I think I'll ignore it. I'll ignore the symptoms. Yes, and also particularly for someone Kate's age. Yes. 42, young, fit, healthy, you don't expect to get that kind of of diagnosis mm. and that's why she described it as such a shock but we are told now by the NHS and by various cancer charities that they did see a big surge in website traffic uh, following that so Macmillan at Cancer Support saw 100,000 visits to their website between Friday night and Sunday night wow. so that's a 10% increase the NHS website saw a five-fold increase in traffic to its cancer pages and in particular the page on cancer symptoms one in every three seconds, somebody was clicking on that to look at the symptoms. Now, of course, we don't know what sort of Kate, cancer Kate has, so we're talking about general information uh, being searched out. But we did see a similar pattern after the King revealed yes. his diagnosis. And yesterday, Sarah Ferguson, the Duchess of York, who herself has uh, been going through double uh, cancer, battles against, uh, she had breast cancer and now uh, she's been treated for skin cancer as well. She praised uh, Kate for having the courage to come forward and she then said, you know, it will make a huge difference and it will save lives because somebody of her profile talking about it is hugely significant. I mean, it really is a very important contribution to make, isn't it? And certainly, you know, the King um, has been so specific about the enlarged prostate and then the cancer that was found that you can imagine men all over the country and all over the world thinking, well, hang on a minute, what were his symptoms? Let me just check. Oh, gosh, I better go and get myself sorted out. And if the King's undergoing treatment, then I can undergo treatment. It, 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 I mean, it is a, an, an a sort of unexpectedly vivid way, in a way, for the royal family to make Make a heck of a contribution to their subjects' lives and even longevity, a way that we hadn't necessarily thought of before. And it is unprecedented, yeah. isn't it, to have them talking in such a way about their medical diagnoses. Uh, and uh, Kate, we're told, was encouraged by the reaction from the public to the King speaking about his own diagnosis. Mm -hmm. She wanted to put that statement out there. She wanted to be upfront with the public. Uh, and she also felt that perhaps she could make a difference. And of course, the end of that statement, as we discussed at great length uh, on Friday after it, particularly uh, touching, I thought, when she said to other people who were going through this, you are not alone. Absolutely. And, and, uh, and we remember, you know, sort of great uptick and upsurge in, in people getting themselves checked out and getting treatment when, for example, Jade Goody was diagnosed yes. with cervical cancer and also when Kylie Minogue yes. was diagnosed with breast cancer. And we know that people all over the world did take their leave from them. So it can be very important. The Jade Goody effect was really remarkable because young women who wouldn't normally have gone and got themselves checked, wouldn't have gone for screening, yeah. suddenly thought, it could happen to me, I need to go for my regular screening. That was the same as Sarah Ferguson said about her breast cancer diagnosis that was found at a routine mammogram screening uh, that she almost didn't go to. And so she spoke out to say, you must not miss these appointments, you really must make sure you take care of yourself because the best thing that you can do with cancer is to find it early. Yes. And that makes a huge difference in terms of the ability to treat it and, and your prognosis. Meanwhile, as we know, King Charles is being treated. We assume he's having chemotherapy. Um, but he has made the announcement that he will be attending church at Easter, which I'm assuming will be incredibly comforting to so many people who see him. Absolutely. So we've had confirmation from Buckingham Palace today that uh, King Charles will, alongside uh, Queen Camilla, be attending the Easter Sunday matin service at St George's Chapel on the Windsor Estate, along with other members of the family. Now, we don't know exactly who will be there, but we do know that the Prince and Princess of Wales won't be there. They've already announced that they're going to be spending uh, the Easter weekend privately with their family uh, following Kate's uh, cancer diagnosis. 
basis. But uh, I think it's a really good sign that the King is going to attend. We know Peter Phillips, his nephew, talked about how frustrated he is at not being able to get back to those public duties. He's been pushing to do a little bit more. Uh, we've seen him today uh, in the car being driven from Windsor Castle. He's also been meeting community faith leaders uh, today at Windsor. Um, but he's desperate to get back. There's a few important dates coming up in the calendar, which we'll have to uh, see about. One of them is the 80th anniversary of D-Day, mm -hmm. which will be hugely important for the royal family. Ascot, Trooping the Colour, all coming up in June. But this is very heartening because if he's pushing to do more, he must be feeling energetic, he must be feeling better, he must be, or he wouldn't be able to do more. Look, and I don't think he's perhaps going to be the easiest patient. Nobody has ever said that, and I think the Queen herself has said she's trying to, to keep him in check uh, on this. He certainly wants to get back uh, to work, but the fact that he is able to do something like going to church mm -hmm. uh, with members of the family on Easter Sunday... Uh, you know, will have been given medical advice that he's able to do that. I think that's a really encouraging and positive sign. Meanwhile, at the beginning of the programme at four o'clock, I said one of the stories that we're going to be covering today is P. Diddy and the investigation into various allegations of sexual impropriety, assault and various other things that have been levelled at him. I didn't necessarily think when I was announcing that that was coming up on the show that there'd be any link at all between that story and our royal family. But actually, as soon as you arrived in the studio, you told me that's not the case. Yes. Now, I should say from the outset, there's no, uh, absolutely no suggestion of any wrongdoing on the part of Prince Harry, but his name has been mentioned in this lawsuit against uh, Sean Coombs. Now, it's a 73-page uh, lawsuit. Uh, Prince Harry's name is mentioned once in it, and his name is used to suggest that uh, Sean Coombs, P. Diddy's associations with high-profile and influential figures, among them uh, Prince Harry, gave him some kind of legitimacy. Now, this photograph was taken in 2007 at the concert for Diana at Wembley Stadium, at Prince Harry there in the middle of Kanye West and uh, P. Diddy. We don't know actually whether there's been any further contact, what that relationship is like, whether there is in fact any kind of uh, lasting association uh, whatsoever, uh, but certainly um, fascinating uh, reading and uh, Prince Harry said, won't, won't have wanted his name to have been dragged up in such a lawsuit. And now we mention another member of the family who won't want his name dragged up but has absolutely no choice in the matter at all and that is Harry's uncle Prince Andrew who is the subject now of not just one but two forthcoming films. Yes, uh, about that uh, Newsnight interview, the infamous uh, Newsnight interview that uh, the Duke of York famously thought had gone well, uh, but in fact was an absolute disaster, yes. car crash interview, and that will be studied for years to come in terms of how not to do PR. Uh, the Netflix have a film coming out called Scoop on the 5th of April, and this is the story of Sam McAllister, the Newsnight booker, who managed to secure that interview uh, with Prince Andrew, and it, it tells the story behind the scenes, just went on, what went on. She tells a fascinating story mm. about those kind of meetings. I mean, I've interviewed her about it before, and she, she's, she's actually a lawyer. Yes, yeah, she's a lawyer so by trade. when she was watching the interview unfold in real life, in real time, she was using her legal brain to kind of assess every word that he said and uttered and could not believe the answers he was giving and had to show no flicker on her face, as Emily Maitlis brilliantly did as well, just complete deadpan expression. And then when he asked Emily Maitlis if she'd like a tour of Buckingham Palace yes. after the interview, so oblivious to the fact that everyone was reeling from the, the kind of things that he had uh, said. Uh, and Sam McAllister talks about for days afterwards, mm. before it was aired, thinking they'll never let this go to air. Yeah. They will never let this go to air. And of course it did. And the what consequences do, but what were What does that huge. denote, though? Just a lack of insight, a lack of self-awareness, a lack Total of decent PR, of who could have said, sir, you know, you, you may not realise, but actually when people hear you say Pizza Express and Woking, they're never going to let you forget that for the rest of your life? Uh, either nobody stood up to him, nobody wanted to tell him the truth. I mean, it's also fascinating when uh, Sam describes Princess Beatrice coming along yes. to one of the initial meetings about uh, the interview 
and, and how that changed her dynamic because she felt she couldn't necessarily ask him the same sort of questions as she might have done. And also, in front isn't of his it daughter. unusual to bring your daughter to a pre interview when really the crux of the subject and the nub of what you're going to be discussing is your association with a convicted sex trafficker, Jeffrey Epstein, and you bring your daughter along? That's very strange, too, isn't it? Yes, the whole thing is just completely bizarre. But it's out on uh, April the 5th, so it sees Gillian Anderson uh, playing Emily Maitlis. Billy Piper is playing uh, Sam McAllister. I, I mean, I think it will be very fascinating and, watch then and excruciating, agonising uh, for uh, the royal family. So to go embarrassing back over an interview that I think they would all like to forget. And then there's another film on the same subject, this time um, uh, produced by Emily Maitland. Yes, yes, exactly. So two coming out. Uh, there is certainly no avoiding this uh, for the Duke of York and uh, it just keeps on coming back mm. to haunt him, doesn't it? And it's true that straight after, well, two days, wasn't it, after the interview was broadcast, it was announced that he was withdrawing from royal duties or being taken away from royal duties. Yes, and then had all of his various responsibilities, his military affiliations, his patronages, they all went and, and, and the rest is history. Mm. You know, he is now effectively in exile uh, in Royal Lodge in Windsor. He has no public role. Uh, we will see him, no doubt, on Easter Sunday. We were talking about which members of the royal family will be there. We will no doubt see uh, the Duke of York and uh, Sarah Ferguson and their daughters uh, attending at church uh, at uh, St George's Chapel because that's a family event yes. and that's different. Um, but when it comes to public events, then there is a very firm line taken by the King. When you say he's effectively an exile, which of course he is, but he's effectively also very present. We saw him at um, at, at the uh, memorial service for King Constantine, the one that yes. Prince William had to pull out of. And there was Andrew, as everybody said, you know, leading the family, prominently there, absolutely front and centre. That's another of instant where you think the PR advisors would have been head in hands. How did we? How did that happen? I think it was just a mistake in the fact that, uh, in the absence of Prince William, and then they all walked out of Windsor Castle to head down the hill to St George. George's Chapel and he walked out first, but it's certainly not the image they want to portray when you had Prince Andrew leading uh, the royal family and European royals as well into the church for that memorial service for King Constantine of Greece. And do you think that the king, when he's well at least, you know, is, is kind of anguished and concerned and, and they discuss, you know, the Andrew problem and what to do about it? I mean, one of the things is, of course, he's occupying this, what is it, 27-bedroom mansion, he and Fergie rattling around, the occasional visit from the grandchildren. Well, we had a lot of talk uh, in the early days of the King's reign, didn't we, about the kind of changes that he might make and slimming down the monarchy and reducing the property portfolio, for example. And, and one of those, we talked about the Windsor Mansion merry-go-round, was whether he might boot Andrew out of a royal lodge mm. and whether he would then take over Frogmore Cottage, which has been vacated by the Sussexes, and allow uh, William and Kate to take up residence at the larger royal lodge, Adelaide Cottage, a four-bedroom uh, property for them. That hasn't happened, and I think most of the talk of that has gone away. Andrew, pretty firm, he's got a lease, he's entitled to stay there, he's paid the bills, and uh, that is his home, and he's not moving. And, and as far as his, his income, I mean, he was uh, a kind of trade on, on envoy and representative, yeah. wasn't he? Yeah. And he was, and he was, you know, in receipt of, of, of money from the kind of royal stipend that they Yes, and get. he's lost his allowance. Yeah. But he does have his inheritance from his mother, ah. uh, the late Queen. And, and also Sarah Ferguson has been working very hard. But she's also a massive, um, a master of debt, isn't she? She's constantly racking up debt. She has been, but she has turned debt. that around and she's now a very successful author among other things uh, and I think you know she's had to take on a lot of the responsibilities of, of footing the bills. Meanwhile we have various high profile particularly Hollywood and US celebrities and presenters and stars saying sorry for the mm. slurs that they caught that they that they um you know lambasted Kate with and one of them is Stephen Colbert who should have known better actually. Yes uh, and interesting because he actually had interviewed Prince Harry at the time uh, of his uh, book coming out um and uh, yes his uh, piece was particularly excruciating to watch. I found others, Blake Lively, who put out a statement saying, look, I'm sure nobody's really interested, it's not really what you want to hear, but I'm absolutely mortified yeah. because she'd done her own sort of photoshopped image mocking uh, the Princess of Wales. And I think that's a lot of the tone from the United States, was mockery, was 
not recognising just how serious uh, this was and seeing it as, as just gossip, yes. really. Gossip about the state of the marriage, gossip about where Kate was. Uh, you know, there were even people selling T-shirts. Where's Kate? It, it became a whole industry and fodder, really, for late night chat shows. Right, and, and I, we noticed um, Kim Kardashian silent. Yes, there, she says she's come under a lot of pressure uh, to apologise. As yet, I haven't seen no. any apology uh, from her, but she had posted that she was off to find Kate, uh, I believe. You know, as I said, everyone jumping onto that bandwagon as if it was some kind of, you know, big entertaining uh, prospect for them all, which, you know, was certainly the tone in the United States. But then when the news came and when... Princess Wells put out her statement on Friday night. The United States, as everywhere around the world, reacting with complete shock and Absolutely. sympathy for her.